Welcome to Kidney Health Interview. I'm your host, Natalia Karpenko. Each week, I interview a guest who a kidney patient, their family member, organ donor, or healthcare professional. Our goal to empower every kidney patient with the support and education. Join our podcast. Today, I have in our podcast studio, Mari Morris. She's a renal dietitian. She has an incredible story about uh, her own journey becoming renal dietitian, starting her practice. Uh, hi, Mari, how are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great, Natalia. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Um, <laughs> it's been uh, really nice to see you again, and I'm so glad that you've got the chance to join this podcast. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a pleasure. Uh, likewise. Uh, so, uh, Mari, I really want to learn a little bit more where you're at in your career. What are your involvements right now? Can you share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Yeah, right now, um, well, I'm located in Sonoma County in California, but we're enjoying a beautiful sunny day today. But a little bit about my career. Um, so right now, I, I'm doing a little bit of everything. I work as a registered dietitian um, in renal nutrition in a dialysis center, and I have done that for over a decade now. Um, but I also teach. I'm really passionate about sharing nutrition knowledge with just the general public and students. And so I actually teach at the local community college, and that's actually where I'm at right now um, before my office hours start. Um, and I also have my own private practice that we just launched earlier this year, um, Nutrition Liberated. So feel free to check us out. Um, but I'm really passionate about nutrition and the power that it has in helping people. And I've, I've known that to be true since I was pretty young. And so I kind of pursued that, knew I wanted to become a registered dietitian from a pretty, pretty early age. So, yeah. So, but that's what I'm doing now. Yeah. That sounds like a lot of great involvement. And uh, how do you manage your time to fit in like three different uh, professional involvements? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> it's a lot. And I'm a mom too, of two young boys, but which I'm mostly doing most of the time, but I don't, you find the time, I guess you just dig a little deeper and um, try to fake it till you make it. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I'm a hot mess, but you know, I think the passion for, for my career and for my family and all the things I do just keep me going. So um, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. Talking about your story and where your career begins, what were your inspiration in them? in your young years about nutrition? Did you see the need of nutrition in your personal life or your surrounding? And how did you decide about this major? Definitely. Um, well, growing up, I was kind of always interested in helping people and I was interested in science. So nutrition kind of seemed like a natural progression, but I didn't really discover that until maybe I was in high school that, oh, I could be a registered dietitian and help people and still have the science. And a lot of that came from uh, well, my mom is an amazing chef, um, you know, self-trained. And actually, my brother is a professional chef and is out there in, in the world doing chefy things. So food was really important for our household. My mom's Japanese, and I think the Japanese culture it really honors food and presentation and really um, using food as pleasure. And so I saw it from that, the culinary standpoint. My dad is a tennis coach, so I saw it from, you know, an athletic performance standpoint and how it's so important for athletes to have proper nutrition to really achieve their best, you know, performance out on the court or the field. Um, and then I saw it from my, my grandmother's perspective. So my um, father's mother, so my paternal grandmother lived with us and she was living with diabetes. She eventually actually went on dialysis later in her life. Um, and so I saw, you know, how what she ate day to day affected how she felt and affected her diabetes, affected how she had to take care of herself and her, her, you know, medical status. And so I think seeing it from all those perspectives, I could kind of see how powerful nutrition and the food we eat every day can really have an impact on so many levels. And I think that's kind of where my love for nutrition started and why I decided to go into nutrition and seek that out as a career. Amazing. Amazing. It sounds like you got such an um, incredible family and um, it seems um, a lot of inspiration that comes from early years. Yeah, I'm very, very lucky to have the family that I have. So, <laughs> um, so just, I, I'm so fascinated always about Japanese culture and cuisine. So what was your favorite food in childhood your mom cooked for you? So uh, it's funny because my mom says that when I was really, really little, I didn't like it at all, but it's 
for most of my life, it's been my favorite food is gyoza, which is like a kind of like a potstick or wonton dumpling, but Japanese style. Um, it can be really garlicky though, but they're so delicious. Um, and so when it's my birthday, like even as a grown woman now, my mom will make me the gyoza, the Japanese pot sticker. <laughs> oh, that's so delicious. Oh, that's so yeah. fun. <laughs> but yeah, Japanese food is like my soul food or my comfort food. Cause that's what I grew up eating a lot with my mom. And, um, yeah, we were very lucky. So, <laughs> uh, so when you define your passion about nutrition and having the environment was uh, constantly showing you that, you know, healthy nutrition is so important. Healthy nutrition is cool. It's entertaining, yeah. it's creative, it's necessary, it's vital. Yeah. How did you decide to go about your passion? Did you know that you want to go to college or did you take any classes to kind of find out if it's something you want to do for your entire life? Well, I think I was able to take a nutrition class in high school, which was great. Um, and it was taught by a registered dietitian at that time, which I know not all high schools have that opportunity, but it was part of like a general health class, but a lot of it was about nutrition. And so there was partly that. And I, I remember one of my best friend's uh, moms just reflected back to me because we were just sitting around a table talking about food and I was just spouting off like, hey, did you know that, you know, this food has this vitamin or this benefit that's good for this? And she's like, you should become a registered dietitian. And to me, I was like, what's a registered dietitian? And so that actually probably is what spurred, you know, my, my first interest in seeking that out as a profession. Because um, in my mind, I thought, oh, maybe I'll pursue being a doctor. But when I kind of learned about what registered dietitians do, I thought, wow, that's really interesting. Um, and I love food. So it kind of marries the two passions that I already was starting to cultivate as a young age. And, um, and so my dad also being a college counselor was really good about, you know, having that conversation about, okay, you're going to college, like <laughs> this is happening. So we were researching colleges pretty early on and UC Davis, was one that really stuck out to me and they have a fabulous program there and I really thrived there and that's where I ended up. Um, but I had set my sights pretty early um, to go there um, to study nutrition. So, um, so you study tend to be very competitive college to get in and uh, how was the preparation process? Uh, uh, was it uh, very time consuming um, to prepare for that? Davis, I'm trying to remember because it, it was kind of a while ago, mm -hmm. <laughs> but <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it was at the time, I think now it's probably even more, there's more involved for students now trying to get into college and pursuing things, but, you know, taking the SATs and preparing your, um, you know, your resume, your experience, the essays you had to write, the applications, the application fees. Um, there were, I think, a lot of little things, but uh, I'm definitely a list maker. I love checking off lists. So as long as I knew, you know, the path that I needed to follow, I think it was, it was within my realm of capabilities. But yeah, I think it was a stressful time at that, but for that time in my life. But, um, but yeah, I'm so glad that I, I went to UC Davis. It's been a positive experience. And I went back there for grad school and partly because that, that reason. So such a positive experience. Um, so you mentioned your passion for science and you said that's why diet and uh, becoming a dietitian was kind of no-brainer. Uh, yeah. So uh, tell me, uh, how did you actually decide to go into uh, renal nutrition since um, there are so many choices in, for registered dietitians and renal one tend to be so challenging and quite complicated. Why did you take the biggest challenge? <laughs> yeah, no, it really is. I mean, I, I reflect that back to my patients all the time, or even, you know, my interns that I mentor, is that, you know, renal nutrition is so specific. There's so many details you have to pay attention to. The phosphorus, the potassium, the protein, more than the average, you know, medical condition. I think part of it was the nitty gritty science around it that I was attracted to, because when I was an intern, so fast forward, graduate UC Davis, I get into my internship. And uh, which was pretty clinical heavy. They had a lot of great experiences and I enjoyed working in the hospital. But when I was able to do a rotation um, in a dialysis center and I met an amazing mentor at that time, Carolyn Parker, and she's still a dietitian today. Um, but she, I really saw how you could build long term relationships with patients in renal, but still get that science you know, nitty gritty, like science nerd, right, right here, um, <laughs> bit of it, because I love, you know, 
the just marveling at the human body and how complicated it is. And I think you still get a lot of that um, in renal, so the clinical side of it. Um, and then, you know, but that balance of both getting kind of a long term relationship with the patients, but also uh, being able to really make an impact. Um, because nutrition is so central in renal nutrition in terms of the progression of the disease, in terms of, you know, just well-being of someone who's, who's dealing with kidney disease. Uh, it really makes a drastic difference when you make those changes. And then I still, you know, was able to have that science fit. So it was kind of a, it just seemed like a, a fit. I had no idea until I went in and started interning into a dialysis center. And then I was like, wow, this this is what I want to do. And it was such a positive experience. That's what I pursued immediately after my internship, after I took my board exams to be a registered dietitian. So. Yeah, that's awesome to hear how much passion you still have for your profession. That's yeah. excellent. Um, uh, Mari, so it has a question. You mentioned that you have multiple involvements now since you've been renal dietitian for more than 10 years and you also teach. Um, Tell us more about your teaching career, where you teach, what kind of classes you teach, and what you like the most to teach about. Okay, great. Yeah, so I think teaching was always a part of something I enjoyed. I just didn't realize that I could be a good teacher until later in life. Um, education, I think, has been strong and as a value in my family. My dad, you know, is an educator um, and is a big proponent of lifelong learning. Um, but... I think for me, why I love teaching so much is being able to, it makes the information new. Like I love teaching these things. I'm like, yeah, this is really interesting. This is really fun. And so by mentoring interns, by teaching here at Santa Rosa Junior College um, for the last three years now, it's been, you know, so much fun because uh, it is really powerful information and it does change lives. It does change how people feel about themselves, even day to day. And um, that's what's so fun about it because I feel like, you know, I, I know about this magic and now I can share it with you and it makes a difference and a positive impact. And that, that just really is what I'm all about, you know? Um, but I, before I started teaching here at Santa Rosa Junior College, I actually spent a few years abroad living in Japan and I taught English. So not really mm -hmm. anything specific to nutrition, although I did do some nutrition counseling here and there. Um, but I discovered then like, oh, I can really do this in a classroom. I can, I really am passionate about teaching too. So when I came back um, from spending a couple years abroad and doing some humanitarian work, I was like, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. So now I do that as well. <laughs> uh, do you think uh, some of this variety of experiences you've done in your past, um, whether in volunteership, education, um, living in another country, help you to gain a better knowledge to become a better educator? Definitely. I think the more world experience you have, the more people that you meet, you realize, you know, how many people are struggling with things or that, that are outside of what you just see when you meet someone. And I think you learn so much more compassion. You um, become a better counselor, a better educator when you can really see the whole person. And I'm really grateful for some of the experiences I've had, you know, traveling and kind of taking a break from nutrition in a way. Um, and living in another country and traveling the world. And um, those were really, I think, beneficial for me just as a person to be a little more introspective and see like, okay, these are things that I can work on, but in the same token, I can be a better mentor to others by being a good student too. Um, so yeah, I think it's been invaluable and I continue to learn from my students, from my interns and the experiences that I have um, in all my jobs. <laughs> yeah, that is very beautiful. And Mary was uh, focused on your own business right now. Uh, how did you decide to run your own practice? Because since you already have your hands full, but was it some passion that you just saw from your family doing entrepreneurship or you just felt there is some need in a place that you want to provide and that maybe not fully addressed? Yeah, I think a lot of those things. I think you touched on quite a few things. So you know, in my family, my brother's an entrepreneur. He has his own business, his blog. He's a chef. He travels the world consulting. My mom, though, I think has really been the inspiration for both of us. And, you know, she came to this country in the 70s and had to basically, she built a business from the cutting room floor up. I mean, she has her own fabric business, but it started with scraps. And I think about her so much now that I'm a mom 
um, like the things, the sacrifices that she made and like how many times she'd be up so late at night doing things for us, for her business. And I, I kind of am starting to understand, you know, that, that passion that she had to, to do this, this entrepreneurship. And so I think I have a little bit of her in me as, as well as I'm discovering, but I think I always in the back of my mind wanted to start a private practice um, if for nothing else to see if I could do it, you know, <laughs> but being so passionate about nutrition, I wanted to be able to kind of do what I wanted to do and serve people, patients, educate, um, people, um, and kind of do it my own way, I guess. And, um, so part of that kind of started or more seriously thinking about it was back in grad school. So, um, Jenna and I, my business partner, um, we were in grad school together and we were both like, yeah, I really want to do this private practice thing. There are ideas I have, things I want to do with this, but we both were a little bit, I think, nervous to do it on our own. <laughs> so together, you know, two heads are better than one. I think, um, we decided to create this private practice and over the last couple of years had been toying with certain ideas and, you know, I had a couple of babies, so things kind of, you know, the, the process wasn't a, straight and narrow road it was kind of a labyrinth of things but we finally launched and we're learning so much about owning a business and doing private practice but it's a lot of fun there's a lot of exciting things that we're we're looking forward to doing um but yeah so i i think that's in part why we decided to do it it always had been in the back of our head and we're like why not now we might as well um but yeah i agree i am a little crazy right for <laughs> throwing this on top of everything else i'm doing but I think that's just how I roll. <laughs> but yeah, so it's um, it's really incredible that you have a role model as your mother that just taught you from young childhood. What should you do to succeed to have uh, your own business, kids, and just get balance and everything, and still influence a, a good habits about healthy Japanese diet, overall <laughs> healthy diet. That's yeah. all. You know, I'm not perfect, and I don't try to be perfect. But yeah, it's I think. I get excited about a lot of things. And so I've always been this way. I want to pursue so many things. And I think where I have to kind of um, practice some self-compassion is to slow down sometimes. So in my adult life, I'm learning, you know, to balance those things because I want to pursue everything. I want to do everything. But um, Amari, so one question, um, very often in entrepreneur community, people compare their own venture to having a baby. So since you have two young boys, do you feel you have a third baby or is it less challenging than having a kid? Yeah, you know, you're right. And I actually, a friend of mine who owns a restaurant had once described that being a restaurant owner is like having a baby that never sleeps, right? Around mm -hmm. the clock things can happen. And I think that's kind of true with being an entrepreneur, especially in the early stages, because you don't know what you're doing <laughs> at the time. And as a new parent, it's very similar. So you have all these worries or what ifs, um, and it feel you feel very like in an unstable stage. You know, you don't know um, what to expect, but you have to put a lot of effort in, and you're learning so much through the process. So I think it is very similar. <laughs> it's still different, but very similar. And um, so in my mind, sometimes, yeah, I think. You know, I had my first son in 2015, my second son in 2017, and then 2019, I had my third baby, my <laughs> private practice, my business. It's definitely keeping me busy. Yeah, so much to come, right? Yeah, yeah but I'm excited for the growth that's you know, to happen. So, yeah. Um, so, uh, kind of going back to your professional side, um, and uh, uh, you mentioned that right now you're focusing a lot on uh, maternal nutrition and also the uh, pediatric or kids nutrition. Uh, is it something that you think you will be pursuing with your business or uh, that is something just you can um, see that so much needed and maybe fully addressed? Yeah, I think early life nutrition is so important. And I think there needs to be more resources out there for parents and families, um, caregivers, but one thing I'm really passionate about is actually pregnancy nutrition. And I kind of obviously have been pregnant a couple of times and can see the value in, you know, proper nutrition, but then, you know, looking at it, you know, when grad school learning about, um, you know, just the depth of the importance of nutrition and development and certain windows of how critical nutrition can be. And I feel like as a mom, as a pregnant woman, you know, I, 
I was the most motivated I'd ever be to make, you know, life changes or health changes. And I find that to be true with clients that I work with. And so it's kind of a great time to really make a big change for people in their health if they haven't, you know, already committed to, you know, taking care of their bodies through food. And, um, and so during pregnancy is a great time to help people um, learn those skills and um, become more confident in, you know, nutrition and, and taking care of themselves. Um, so yeah, it's one of the areas that we focus on uh, because obviously my master's was in a focus on that, but yeah, I enjoy it um, a lot. So with, with that, you know, we've got, um, on our Instagram, we have uh, on Renomate, we have a number of women who are uh, CKD patients and very often they express concerns about um, having a baby and some of other complications. So how do you advise your patients or, uh, you know, patients who come with those conditions, having CKD and deciding to having a baby, um, how would you advise them to go about it? Yeah, I think you, like any woman, right, going and deciding to have a baby can be a really scary process, whether you have CKD or not. Um, I think we need to support women, pregnant women, as better than we are now, and I hope things change. Um, but yeah, I think women that are, have CKD and are looking to get pregnant, it is possible. But of course, everyone's situation is different. So you really need to talk to your care team, you know, get support around you, make sure you've got a physician, an OBGYN that's, that has maybe some experience with working with CKD patients, you know, make sure your nephrologist is on board too, and that you've got all that support, working with a dietitian to make sure you're meeting your needs and you're being tracked closely because you are inevitably going to be a high risk pregnancy. But I have seen even patients on dialysis go on to have a healthy baby, which is amazing. That's right? awesome. That oh, that's yeah. so good to know that. Yeah, that even in something that can seem so bleak as end-stage renal disease, um, you know, life can be birthed out of that, which is amazing. And it, it, I think it speaks to the resilience of women and just the power of, you know, having medical support um, through that process. And it is, it is possible, but of course, you know, everybody is different. So, you know, proceed with caution, but, you know, it doesn't mean that, you have to give up some of the dreams that you have if that's something that you want to do. Yeah, thanks for sharing because uh, it's been a big discussion and we actually are sometimes lacking resources. Women health, nutrition and CKD and ESRD uh, to really address some very specific questions uh, that women have concerns about. Right, understandably, yeah. Uh, so what also, um, Kind of, it seems like a very unique uh, synergy working on the maternal early life nutrition and having more than decade experience in a CKD ESLD space. Uh, what are your lessons right now? Kind of, you've learned in terms of uh, CKD management for early life and uh, maternity. Is there anything very specific to CSM needs in the market or some of uh, main concerns of your patients that you think are? could be changed on a bigger scale than just one-on-one -on -one counseling? Yeah, I think, I mean, it's complicated, right? There's definitely more that we could do just for CKD patients in the earlier stages. I mean, I feel like there definitely needs to be more awareness, not just in the public, but even for general practitioners, I feel like sometimes, and it's not to say anything bad about it. I mean, general practitioners have to deal with so much, but I think if we could highlight or create tools where it would make it easier in screening and following patients um, so that they have that care team instead of just when people hit ESRD and they're on dialysis, they have a great set of care team. They have a social worker, a dietitian, there's insurance managers, there's their physician there, they have you know their techs and their nurses. And I feel like that is a great support structure. But why don't we have more of a care team around CKD patients, um, and and even before that, just making sure that we're really screening for these issues, because I feel like, especially in certain communities where patients aren't always getting the best access to care, you know, they're, they're finding out they have kidney disease much later in the stages, you know, they're already at stage four, or they're stage five, and they just realize they have kidney disease. So I think there's definitely some need there. I don't know what the answer is, but I think there's definitely some innovators 
people like yourself too, that I think can really make a difference in terms of creating tools and awareness um, to help people. So, so they can have a different trajectory, whether or not they decide they're, you know, a woman of childbearing years and want to have a baby or just a average CKD patient. I think there can be more done there in terms of support. Uh, so since we're talking about some of the ways of prevention and early detection of CKD, uh, what will be your advice so with some of our audience who might be just get, start learning about kidney disease and understanding that's usually a disease that is hidden and some symptoms are maybe less evident, uh, what they should be concerned about? Is there any early symptoms they can start looking and kind of getting concerned and what they should do after that when they detect any of those symptoms? Right, and some of the symptoms you might not put off as anything um, extraordinary. Um, so two of the biggest diseases that cause kidney disease or lead to kidney disease is unmanaged diabetes and unmanaged hypertension or high blood pressure. And you know, a third of Americans have hypertension and a lot of those people don't even know that they have it because hypertension or high blood pressure um, is kind of a silent killer, they call it, because you might have headaches or lethargy you, or fatigue. And so those things could be, you know, attributed to so many reasons. Um, but I think getting regular checkups with your physician or even going and get your, getting your blood pressure checked, whether it's through a community health center or at the local pharmacy, a lot of times they have blood pressure tests. I mean, that's one simple way that you can monitor your own blood pressure. Um, and you don't even necessarily have to own a blood pressure cuff. Uh, but I think that is one simple way um, if to find out if you have a risk factor like hypertension. Um, diabetes, again, sometimes those symptoms aren't fully clear, but if you're regularly going and seeing your physician and getting your annual checkups, they will check for your glucose tolerance um, and seeing those lab values. And then in terms of renal disease, you know, checking your GFR, which is your glomerular filtration rate, which is sounds like a crazy word, but it's just referring to how well your kidneys are filtering. And there's certain numbers that um, you'd want to fall within depending on your ethnic background and age, but it kind of is a way that we judge and diagnose kidney disease and what stage you're at. Um, so those are things that you could ask your doctor to check for, or if you go in for regular physicals, could find out. Uh, so question on the GFR, um, with the patients who might be consider themselves in risk but never been diagnosed with CKD, uh, should they just go to their primary care and um, ask them if they can take blood tests for GFR or how do you usually they a class for that kind of labs? Yeah, so usually through your primary physician. I mean, a lot of doctors, when they do a general panel, they will check that too. And especially if you have risk factors like diabetes or hypertension or any family history of kidney disease, I think you could say that to your physician and say like, hey, I heard that, you know, I might have some of these risk factors. I would really like to check this blood panel to see, you know, how my kidneys are doing. And I think a lot of physicians do that. But I think it doesn't hurt for patients to advocate for themselves and to look to see if that's what gets checked. There is also the big part that patients can get involved in more active care of uh, preventing kidney disease, managing their diet, their lifestyle. So what are your go-to tips for patients who just uh, may be looking to improve quality of their life to prevent CKD? Right. I think a lot of health problems, especially preventable health conditions are ones that we can manage um, with behavior changes. It's challenging because I think we get so stuck into patterns that maybe we grew up with that maybe weren't so healthy for us, um, or maybe we have, feel shame about the ways that we take care of ourselves, that it gets us stuck in certain behaviors that prevent us, limit us in taking care of ourselves. And so I, for me, one thing that's been a big discovery in just my own counseling style is I've really switched gears from being kind of the old school thought of, you know, we're kind of the food police. And I don't believe in doing that because it doesn't work. I'm not here to punish you for making the choices that you made. And I think doing the work that I do with patients around, um, it's called motivational interviewing, but it's really just being a coach, like standing side by side and saying like, this is hard and this is rough, but hey, this is how we move forward. And I'm hearing you want to make changes here. Let's start focusing on small changes 
that you can achieve, so you can build confidence, because a lot of it is the belief. It's the mental perspective around your interaction with physical activity and diet um, that really prevents you from achieving those goals a lot of times. And I find that to be true with a lot of my patients. It's just the thought of, well, I don't think I can do that. I've never done that before. Well, how do we build the confidence so you can start to feel that you can achieve these goals and you can live a much healthier function, you know, functioning life despite, you know, your diagnoses or because of your diagnoses. And I've seen that time and time again with my patients make that shift, that mental shift and really start to build on and build um, momentum in improving their health. But I think it really starts with thinking differently and having good supportive people around you to, to start building those positive goals, working with, you know, a social worker, working with a dietitian to um, look at those things and take the time because that's self care ultimately, right? It's taking that time to, those little day-to-day habits that really add up um, and, and staying motivated, which can be hard. We're human, right? But I think looking at the inhibiting factors of factors that stand in the way, look at the barriers and look at the reasons why we are motivated. Maybe it's our family. Maybe it's getting to that, you know, family member's wedding or being able to physically do something like do a 5k. I mean, who knows what that goal is, but having those in mind and reminding yourself why you're doing this, because change can be really hard sometimes, a lot of the time, let's be real. Um, But I think having someone to kind of guide you through that can be really beneficial and helpful. And I've seen it really work for a lot of my patients that I've seen. I really admire the way how you explain that um, the patient starts and it's very complicated. And that as a dietitian, it's not only the role of giving and controlling what is right and making sure the patient does it what is right, but really assessing a uh, very complex lifestyle of a patient, the reasoning, the causes, and then building behavior change that seems more natural for the patient. Um, you mentioned coaching and you mentioned accountability. Is it a new trend in renal nutrition, in uh, uh, lifestyle management that are like right now upcoming and some patients need to keep eye on those trends? Yeah, I think there is a big paradigm shift happening in the medical community and um, with things like motivational interviewing, which actually was birthed out of addiction treatment, which makes sense because you can lead a horse to water, right? They say, but can't make them drink. And I think that's true. I mean, if someone told you, hey, you need to do this, you immediately want to be defensive and say like, what? You can't tell me what to do. And I think we're realizing that now with the old school of being, you know, medical police or food police and being punitive about things doesn't work. It doesn't help people. And ultimately, that's what we're here for. We're here to help our patients, our clients. I mean, these people we care about um, to achieve these goals and live a more healthy, fulfilling life. Um, But yeah, so coaching, I think, is becoming more of maybe a trend. But I think it's a trend that's going to stick around because for me, too, as a clinician, being a partner with my client or patient versus like, I'm now responsible, right? I put the ball back in the court of my clients and my patients, and then they can feel really empowered because it's them that's making the changes. I can educate them all I want, but if they're, you know, not willing to do it, or it's not their goal that they want to do, it's not um, with their own volition, it's not going to be very rewarding for them. It's not going to be sustainable. But when you achieve something because you wanted to and you put the time in it's so much more rewarding and I and and then as a clinician to see that I feel like wow I can really make an impact that way and I'm not you know taking too much responsibility for my patients either I'm holding the space for them to achieve these goals and to take pride in the efforts they're making and to really own it own their own health I think way more people will be wanting to try and put an effort when they have a support empowerment instead of judgment and maybe disbelief totally there's so much judgment out there there's so much you know people trying to shame you into things but you don't have to bully yourself to make positive health changes at all i mean we have enough inner bully we don't need someone else telling us that and i think having friends you know having that you know open rapport almost friendship like rapport you someone you can trust someone that's going to help motivate you and also keep you accountable like call you out when it's like, hey, you know, you said you were going to do this goal. So what, what's going on? 
on? Like, how can we move forward too? You know, it's not, um, so it's just to help be a guide, right? You're working side by side along this path. Um, but yeah, I think it's really powerful. And I think we all need that in our lives, whether, you know, we're dealing with kidney disease or just life stuff. <laughs> I see a lot of coaching and mentorship that came in professional career and education and has been such a great success. And it's really great to adopt those practices in our lifestyle management disease and disease prevention just makes so logical and kind of intuitive that learning path. And it's uh, also has less pressure because it takes a time to own something, to adapt to something. Yeah, I think for me, I mean, it may sound ironic, but I'm kind of a non-diet dietitian in that I don't believe in fad diets. Um, so we can refer to like specific diets like for renal nutrition as a renal diet, but it's a therapeutic diet. The point is to make someone feel better with the diet, right? To make their health better. Um, but with a lot of these fad diets or yo-yo dieting where people severely restrict, you know, a food group or calories, and yeah, they do lose weight, but is it sustainable? I mean, we know that more than 90% of these fad diets don't work. People rebound and often gain more weight back, and then they feel shame about it. And then it's like this vicious cycle. And when we study specifically women um, who've done this pattern over their life, even if they started out obese, they ended up having a higher mortality rate than women that just stayed obese and just accepted it. Um, so I think that's a really powerful statement in terms of body positivity, that sometimes the way we perceive our bodies is really important as well. Um, that we don't use shame to try to motivate ourselves into change because it isn't sustainable. Um, so that's one thing. Um, and then there was another part to your question and now I'm forgetting it. <laughs> How someone shift their uh, life habits to adopt better diets, start cooking or start doing something that improves their diet, but wouldn't put too much effort on you to change everything, uh, you know, upside down in their life to get there. Right. And it can feel overwhelming when you feel like you need to make big changes, but they don't have to be big and you, you're not going to change overnight. I think it's good to start with what feels right. Um, what's something that seems achievable and sustainable first and see how that goes. Cause Remember, the changes that you make need to be over a lifetime. And that may sound overwhelming, but that means they can be small things and they can make a big difference with time. Um, and so these drastic fad diets, I feel like, can be so dangerous because they're selling people that, you know, that they're, something's broken with them, basically, and that's why they have to follow this diet. And it's not that at all. It's really just, you know, focusing on something small. So it could be maybe you want to swap out the soda you're drinking for water or flavor water because you don't like having clean water. So you, you find creative ways in solving that solution uh, or solving that problem. Um, or maybe you want to try to cook more. So it's setting some small goals. And I think it really depends on the person. Um, but when you do achieve something you know, short term, you know, set a goal for the next two weeks or the next month. Like you're just going to try to meal plan or you're going to shop at the store. Or you're going to spend time on Saturday night for one hour and you put it on your schedule to plan what you're going to eat for the next week. So you don't stress about it or then end up, you know, eating out or getting something quick because you don't have anything at home to eat or because you didn't budget or, you know, things like that. It's trying to prepare yourself for the, the things, the changes, the turns in the road that can happen, you know, in day-to-day -day life um, can be really positive too um, for patients. So. Yeah, so many good tips. It seems like that's such a refined process where you just pick a few things and you change them and gradually you just um, improve step by step. And uh, uh, just a couple trends I want to run by you and see what your thoughts are just from... <laughs> Um, so there is, there have been uh, a big trend of uh, health juices. There are so many health juices, uh, health smoothies, and they're certainly very expensive too. They uh, promote a lot of uh, nutritious value in them. Well, what do you think about uh, those kind of foods for uh, meal substitution or just in general having a fresh, fresh juice or uh, some kind of brands that have very similar nutrition value? So I think ultimately, if you can eat your fruits and vegetables, you're probably better off. Um, and they are really expensive. So I feel like sometimes 
people think that it's more desirable because they, they put this big price tag on it. But for the most part, I don't really advise people to do juice cleanses. I mean, your liver, your kidneys detox your body naturally. <laughs> you don't need to juice cleanse for two weeks to be healthier. And, and for some people, especially even CKD patients, that could be really dangerous to um, deprive yourself. So, um, of, of food and only drink juice. Now, if you, if juice you have from time to time, I think that's fine. And if it, it can be a really pleasurable experience to have a fresh pressed juice, but um, I think the hype is oversold for sure in terms of the benefits and, and things like that. <laughs> okay, I got the second one. Uh, so there are a lot of trends right now about the energy bars and there is like this big revolution every week we have a new energy bar coming up and uh, many of them right now competing over less sugar, more fat, more protein and there are a lot of additive proteins uh, that um, um, are part of their nutrition. Um, what are your thoughts on those? Right. And, you know, even in the Bowel Center, we actually use some protein bars as a simple way to deliver protein and calories for patients that need it. And I think it can be warranted when you use it in a therapeutic way. But it is, you're right, it is a super trend right now. And everybody's into the latest new bar. Oh, did you hear about this one? It's got this in it or that in it. Um, if you have any health conditions where you do have to worry about potassium or phosphorus, you do need to really read the labels, check with your dietitian, check with your physician to see um, if it's something that's, you know, in, in line with what you should be eating, because it potentially could be something that gives you too much of something. Um, but I think they're okay to incorporate into a diet. But again, like they're expensive. And I wish I had the visual, but um, there was this one dietitian that had posted kind of the micro and macronutrient content of and I won't name the brand, but a certain popular protein bar versus just a half peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And there was more nutrient density in the half peanut butter and jelly sandwich. Incredible. Wow. So it's kind of like we get excited about the packaging and something new. I mean, I get it. That's It's fun, right? That's part of the selling um, or the snackability of it. But when you look at the nutrition and the hard numbers, a lot of times it's not providing you any more than you could just get from regular food. So. Awesome. <laughs> uh, so I got the last trend I want to run by you. Um, sure. uh, so in the renal community, uh, there is certainly a big concern about ph phosphorus intake and uh, dairy products uh, uh, tend to be the ones that have a high phosphorus and um, there are a lot of uh, need for substitution or reduction. Uh, so market offers non-dairy uh, yogurts, non-dairy butter, non-dairy cheese, uh, non-dairy milks. Uh, what are your thoughts on those? Again, like, um, you know, it's a cashew, it's a rice, it's a soy, it's almonds, macadamia, and the list goes on and on. Uh, so which ones would you recommend for kidney patients to consider? And then for anyone who's just healthy and looking for more preventative diet, what would you recommend for them to consider selecting the brand and sort of kind of alternative milk? Okay. So yeah, it is a big trend now. Um, and for people certainly that follow a vegan or vegetarian diet that want to avoid dairy products, there are a lot of plant-based milks out there. Um, nutrition wise, there is a little more nutrient density from animal-based milks. You do get more vitamins and minerals, but you want to make sure that um, depending on your disease state. So for people that have CKD, you do need to worry about potassium and phosphorus content. Um, and even plant-based milks may be high in that. Certainly some soy and almond milks do have that, but there, it really is brand specific. Um, and so I think the classic ones that we recommend in CKD for low phosphorus, low potassium is like rice stream, rice milk. Um, there is also an almond milk um, by, and I'm forgetting the name now off the top of my head. I'm trying to remember my, I have a whole handout that I give to my patients um, because there's new products all the time. So we really have to stay up to date on it. And one year it's okay and one year it's not. So again, it's something you could check with your physician or, or your dietitian. Um, um, but they are fine. And, but like anything else, you still probably will have to limit the amount that you're including in your diet. I have patients that still have dairy, but they may only have like one serving in a day. And that's, what works with their body and their disease so thanks so much thanks so much for satisfying my selfish reasons <laughs> uh, okay. all of these questions um, 
Uh, Mari, it's been so incredible to connect with you and so nice to learn about your career, your inspirations, and also that great knowledge you shared. Um, so one thing I want to just check with you, what are your goals for Nutrition Liberated for the next five years? Okay. <laughs> great question. And you know, I don't know if I fully know the answer because we're still kind of being in the first year, we're still kind of getting our bearings and looking at um, kind of the trajectory and things that we want to focus on. Um, of course, we're doing one-on-one -on -one counseling, we're doing workshops, but I really want to start developing more online classes because that is definitely in my wheelhouse as a teacher and instructor and the ability to maybe share more of this knowledge in a fun, um, very digestible way that's accessible to for people that may be more affordable as well. Because sometimes the one-on-one -on -one counseling can be, the price tag can be up there for sure for some people. And I, I understand that. So to reach a bigger audience, I think one of the things we're looking at is developing some online course modules for the general public, but even maybe considering um, tailoring um, some, you know, 15 minute videos you get weekly in your inbox or maybe even daily one day um, for physicians too to stay up to date on nutrition out there. And I think there's a need for that as well um, because they're so busy um, and they don't get a lot of that education in, in medical school. And how could they? They're learning so many other things. Um, but I think there's a need for other medical professionals to be up to date on, on the research and, and practical ways to apply some of this advice um, in their practice too. So. Yeah, that's kind of where we're going, I think. <laughs> but who knows, check in with me and, and it might change. <laughs> yeah, we could, we'll occupy on your own uh, business uh, as well as we'll check with you maybe in the following webinar uh, where you can share a little bit more insights about the CKD and renal nutrition. Sure, I'd love it. So. <laughs> yeah, thanks so much. So great to have you and amazing energy. We so appreciate it, your time. Thanks. Thanks for your time too. I appreciate it. <laughs>